Right, hi everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us, and thanks to Blender for uh, giving us a spot in this apparently very huge theater. He's Sam, I'm Thomas, we're from Ghent, Belgium, and we'd like to take you on our little adventure today. Right, so since 2015, I've been working as an, an artist in the VFX and CG industry, and like many of us, probably, I have a little side project going on. Yeah, and I've been working as a project manager, but especially in the websites and mobile apps industry. So these are my first steps into the world of animation and into the world of Blender. Before we start, just a small, well, on this screen, rather a huge disclaimer. This is no success story yet. <laughs> um, we, have, we have tried a lot. <laughs> We have tried a lot, we have failed a lot. And you all know those motivational talks on TEDx, on YouTube, wherever you, you go, about failure as a stepping stone to success? Well, we can't vouch for them. We aren't there yet. We hope they might be true, because then within a few years, we might experience success with this project. But not at the moment, yet. So. Uh, I hope we can resonate with a lot of you guys that have some side project going on and that yeah, are thinking about, should we go further with this? Should we stop with it? Or will it ever see the light of day? But we hope you will notice that what we talk in the rest of our talk will, yeah, you will, you will know it. <laughs> so, Sam, can you tell us a little bit about the project? I actually can. So, Aslin is my short film project. And it's basically, it's a CG short film where I tell a very personal story. And sadly, in that one sentence, I've basically summed up all of our problems as well. Yeah, so it's CGI. And we want it to, be, to look good. So you are the expert, so you, you know what that means. We need the whole crew. We need uh, very much people, a, a very large team. And yeah, that's difficult. It's a short film. So I don't know, anyone in the audience knows about the business plan for a short CGI movie that results in positive numbers? <laughs> we, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> As far as I know, it doesn't exist. But, yeah, maybe. <laughs> then it's six minutes. It's only six minutes. That should be a good thing. But six minutes is still 360 seconds. <coughs> if you multiply that with the average price of one second of animation, well, you roughly get the equivalent of to build a moderate house. And that's a lot of money. And last but not least, it's a personal story. So it's not made to put advertising in it. It's not made to have product placement, not, make, not made to put branding in it. So, yeah, we need a big team. We don't have a business plan. Um, it's, it's costly to be only six minutes. And we can't get money out of advertising. So, sorry, Sam, but it's, it's impossible. Are, are you giving up now? Like, can, I, can I at least try and show them like, how we got where we are today? Cool, thanks. Okay, okay. So, um, thank you. The story of Aslin is about a little boy that's growing up in a world that's a lot, a lot bigger than us. And for a child, this can be a very daunting thing to do. Like, you're growing up, you're having to find you know, your place in a world that's, that's so much bigger, and it's, it can be very scary. Like, okay, so this image is a lot spookier than I had in mind, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's sometimes what it can look like for, for a little child. And um, so basically to, to remedy this, he likes to dream off, like during the day, like at school, as, you know, we all do, I think. And um, to do that, he has a, a little cardboard figurine of a knight that he made himself. And um, so, yeah, he dreams off, but in the course of the story, at one point he loses it and he discovers that he can't dream anymore. So then the story is about how he tries 
to get it back. So um, I've always wanted to make a nostalgic short film. So it's set in the, uh, the fall of 1995, and it's sort of like based on uh, childhood memories, obviously, condensed in a, a charming story with a bit of slightly darker undertones. And while this is, this is very much of an artist's approach, so it's very visual, and it's based on what I like to make as a 3D artist, um, so I've had to learn, basically, that what you want to tell with it is actually much more important, and story has to take priority over the visuals. Um, next, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I was lucky enough to be working at a studio at the time where I had a lot of friends and colleagues who actually wanted to help out with this. Um, but the remainder of work that was that's still left to do is too much for just me, and I certainly cannot do everything well. Like, I have my, you know, what I dare to call expertise, and there's stuff that I'm really, really bad at. So, um, and also the fact that you still need, you know, a full-time job to pay the bills and continue living, um, it doesn't really help in, in this regard. Um, so that's when the, the overly realistic people that are always around us are telling us that side projects are there to bite the dust. And that's when I basically turn into a person that prefers working off radar and think like, okay, so when I'm ready with this, it will amaze people, but you know, later on, just let me work in quiet and basically. <laughs> so um, um, yeah, you can see we really went for the um, really poetic slide titles today. Um, because starting a project for real is much of an uh, emotional roller coaster. Um, who else can sleep when they get in the zone in the middle of the night? I'm sure there's, there's already a few hands. Okay, cool, really cool. <laughs> um, this happened to me in the spring of 2016, which today I still mark as the start of this project. Um, but to be fair, it also still happens like almost on a weekly basis. And I heard like uh, on Thursday morning, there was this talk by Ian Hubert, who mentioned the thing called the uh, deceptive free time unit. It's the area between you were planning to go to bed and the point at which you actually do. And I found my life to be like a collection of those. So uh, that was very, very recognizable. Um, this thing. <laughs> I didn't even come up with a more poetic name for it because they already did. And our industry is very notorious for making you feel like a fraud. Because, so, I'm a 3D artist. And I'm all of, my, all of a sudden calling myself a director. That's something that I did not go to school for. So, am I qualified to do that? Like, I feel like I can do it. I, I watch a lot of movies. I know exactly what story I want to tell. And so, I'm basically looking at these things, thinking I can try at least to do similar things, because apparently that's how you make movies. And before I actually get there, the only way of finding out whether or not I can do it is by trying. But that's when, that's when everyone else will tell you, like, you know, fake it till you make it, because that's how that works. But when you're feeling down about this whole, you know, industry pressure and everything, and how tiny you are within the whole concept of it, that faking part is really, really not easy. All right, so that's how the past three years went. Um, it all had a certain goal. There was not a lot of focus, because it was just me. Um, we managed to get some visual work done, because these people were helping me out and everything, but there was no project management, there was no pipeline, there was not even an overview, basically. Um, and what I, also, what I also noticed is that other short film projects, many of which are like, some of which are, are even here, the people who made them are here at the Blender Conference, and they, they were lucky to have people around them that just want to make something. They want to make a short film. And what it's about, they will discover later on together. I'm not in that situation now, because this is a story that's based on my childhood and something I really want to tell with visuals that I really remember from when I was a kid. And if people want to help me out doing that, that's just because they love what they do. But they are not you know, dropping everything to just be able to be a part of this. Um, so in order to stand a chance of even realizing a project on this scale, things have to get a little more official than what an artist likes to think about. Because you're asking people to work for you, and that's not always, you know, evident. 
And that's so that's why. when Thomas came into the picture. I <laughs> came into the picture. So I know Sam for 10 years or so right now. Um, and I was searching in the beginning of this year for a new project, some creative thing to uh, go for. And <coughs> I know he was working on his side hustle on this, this project. And he was here in Amsterdam. And I was coming to Amsterdam for the, the FITC conference. And we met up in some fancy cocktail bar. Uh, and he told me the story, the story of Aslin, which wasn't called Aslin at that time. Um, and it, it, really, it was really a nice story. He showed me some artwork that was already done, that he did together with some friends, with colleagues. Um, and I really liked it. And I was convinced, yeah, maybe I should pursue this and, and go with him and, and try to make it indeed a, a real adventure for us. So we looked together to see what was missing, because we had all those loose assets. And we didn't have the real overview. And as a project manager, I like that helicopter view. So Sam started to create the complete storyboard. Well, we had a part of it, but we made it complete. And so we got the nice pacing of the movie, and we knew what we needed. We got the asset list from that. We knew uh, which profiles we needed to create that asset. Uh, we knew we could make the timing on it, we could make the, the, the complete estimation of it. So in the end, we had a full estimation, what budget we would need to create this movie. And all of a sudden, well, everything seemed very expensive. Yeah. So, yeah, in financing, I already told you, it was almost the, the equivalent to build a, a moderate house. And that's because, yeah, we need the modelers, the texturing artists, the production designer, the riggers, the layout artists, animators, sound engineers, the whole shebang. And even if we slightly underpay everyone, you know how that goes, uh, and definitely ourselves, yeah, we still need a few hundred thousands of euros. And that's a lot. So we went looking, where can we get that money? How can, can we get this started? We are from Belgium, we have a nice government there. Well, sometimes we have. Um, and they have, have a nice support for projects like this. They have grants and they can pay almost 50% of the budget you need, we can get from that grants. But it's not the first 50%, it's the second 50%. So before you can start, you have to prove, hey, we have half of it ready, and we have half of it in our pockets. But yeah, we can invest some of our own money, but our pockets aren't that deep. So we started looking further. How can we get that first half? So we need an investor. And we started checking with production companies, uh, with producers. But there we faced rejection. We mostly got the, the no time answer. And that shouldn't surprise, since we are just two random guys, not connected with our names to one crazy project or a crazy movie we're working on. So we're just calling them or mailing them, hey, uh, we have a nice idea, we don't have any money, we don't have a business plan, um, can you help us? <laughs> uh, it's for them not the most commercial thing to do. So, mm, it's impossible. Are, are, you, are you giving up again? Um, no, not, not really, but cool. you certainly have the answer about what's next and how we are going there and how I we are have. seeing that finish line. I might have. So let me tell you what happened a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the Playground Conference in Eindhoven, where I saw this great talk by uh, Max Berman and Max Boutet who are a few industry veterans, basically. And the thing in their presentation, they talked about the same things, just they have a lot more experience. And the thing that struck me the most in their presentation was their focus on the fact that we can create without permission. And if there's anything that the Blender software stands for, that is that everyone should be able to make anything they want at any time. And within the frame of reference of a production pipeline, that one stage where that's the most true, is the creation of the pitch bible. 
It's what you want to make to propose your idea and to get the people on board that you that you want to that you that you need basically. Um, next. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> with that Bible, we have to find the right people, and um, this is where connections are everything. So of course we're talking producers. Um, but we're also talking smaller production studios who just, you know, need a project to fill up their bench time or something. We're also talking investment branches of bigger studios, theaters, cinemas, festivals. Um, but we're not put on this planet knowing everybody from the start. So I like the idea of knowing people who know people because it's also very much a thing in our industry and it's also the first and maybe only stepping stone you have and definitely in the beginning. Yeah. And if we talk about convincing people, we of course also have to talk about convincing you, about convincing the crowd. So crowdfunding, crowdsourcing are probably two of the most viable ways of getting a project like this started and finished. So there are a lot of well, examples of people who did that. You have Being Good, that was a um, short film that was completely crowdsourced. You have Lanoria, that was partly crowdfunded. So there are a lot of, of examples of, this, of it. Um, crowdsourcing also is the thing that brought this movie, this project, uh, as far as it is right now. So it's, the project is not completely non-existent. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a good thing, but it's also a double-edged sword. So you ask people to work for free, and everybody always tells people never to work for free. Because, yeah, it's your skill set, so you, you have to, to de you deserve to get paid for it. And uh, as, as a, a, another part, so we lose uh, some, some uh, part of, of the uh, deadlines and the milestones. So they work for free, they have a limited amount of free time, and there can come different things in between. So if we lose that, we can't make them work as much as possible to get that deadline and to get that milestone. So these are little problems with that. And then for crowdfunding, well, this project is too big to crowdfund. I've said it before, our names are not that big enough to just convince people they have to put their own money in it and be sure we will finish that, this project within a few years. We don't earn that yet. So the first thing we're doing now is working at that uh, pitch bible, to have that completely ready. Then we're going to look to make maybe one teaser scene, 15 seconds, where people really can see what we want to do with this movie, what, what the end result of the movie will be. And then maybe we can convince some people, maybe we can go s to a production company, maybe we can uh, start a, a crowdsourcing campaign or a crowdfunding campaign. But that still, yeah, it's, it's, it will shift our focus. And shifting our focus from the end result of a movie to uh, the marketing of a Kickstarter campaign, yeah, it's a totally different thing. But we know what to do next. All right. Um, so, like we said, everything we have at this point was either made by me or my friends and my colleagues that wanted to help out. Um, so everything we have at this point would not be here without these people that I would like to take it, look, this short slide to uh, be basically acknowledge that. Um, they spent some time like either making something for real that's in there or uh, explaining something to me, figuring something out, introducing me to people that um, might help me down the line. Um, and as you can see, there's a small selection of artwork here um, that we collected that's already there. Um, there's a lot of environment and uh, look deaf as well, um, some lighting, and of course the beautiful character designs that are already there. Uh, there's part of the, of the animatic that was made um, with using both uh, proxy geometry and the, the new grease pencil tools. Um, and yeah, so because there's no pipeline yet, Basically, nothing is 
a pipeline is very helpful, but it's also very hindering because it you know, divides everything into tasks and they're all sequential, pretty much sequential. Um, because that's not there yet, I can do everything at the same time, so that's very helpful. Um, oh yeah, and there's also the, the rough storyboards here and there that are just made with good old pen and paper. <laughs> so, nothing is impossible. We're here. Much better. <laughs> We're seeing a way forward. We have next steps. And we, we just have to do it and have to go for it. Exactly. It's just not easy either. Also true. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> While it makes us often, very often think, like, what the hell are we doing? This is a passion project. And the definition of a passion project is that you should pursue it because it's your passion. It also constitutes all, you know, the bad stuff. But it makes, it makes sure that you know what you're doing and you, you, you actually want to do it. Yeah, and of course, always keep envisioning the end result. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of shared ground here. Uh, I'm sure, like, at least with some of you. So come find us during the conference and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you. <laughs>